Now for scripture reading this morning, we have our very own youth, Phoebe, uh, leading us in our scripture reading. Today's scripture reading is taken from Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and in deceitful schemes. Speaking in the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thank you for in scripture reading. The Lord's Messenger this morning is our brother Timmy, discipling youth. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, just want to say before I start, um, to all the youths as well as those who are youthful, happy Youth Day. Now, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the leadership for inviting me to address you this morning on a very needful topic, even though I think that there are more qualified, experienced, and wiser brothers and sisters to talk about this specific topic and other related topics. Now, while I'm here, uh, with your pardon for my limitations also, I will still do my best uh, to bring you what I've observed uh, from my readings as well as my personal experience from serving and discipling youths as a ministry staff in, this, in our church for more than a decade and three years now serving and discipling students in, Christian, in the Christian ministry of ACS Independent. Now, this morning, we will be looking broadly uh, at a topic of why it is important for parents and the body of Christ to faithfully strive to disciple youths. Once again, uh, the topic that we will be looking at this morning is why it is important for parents and the body of Christ to faithfully strive to disciple youths. Allow me to quickly pray again as we begin. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and minds this morning helping us to suspend our presuppositions, our bias, and perhaps to also address our fears, or the I couldn't care less or defeated spirit as we humbly listen, as we hear and learn from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I, I, re I really appreciate the advertisements uh, of P&G, um, Procter & Gamble, what they produce whenever the Olympics is coming, uh, comes along. And there are two advertisements that are closely related to our topic today. Allow me to play the advertisements for you.
of course, I'm biased. Uh, I'm wondering why do these uh, companies uh, portray uh, more of the stories of female caregivers than those of fathers, grandfathers, as well as the main caregivers who are male. But of course, there are advertisements like this as well for the guys. When I was younger, I needed you. Right there with me. To feel safe. Confident. Like I could do anything. Until I realized that even when you weren't by my side, You're always here. Always with me. Of course, there are the Thai advertisements as well uh, for fathers. <laughs> Okay, but jokes aside, uh, I would just like you to catch the main idea of uh, the, the advertisements and see how it relates to our topic. Now, every Olympic athlete can potentially emerge a champion, not, because, not just because of their natural God-given talents or their own effort. They still need others to support them throughout their athletic journey, people who would care for them, who nurture and guide them. However, among the many people, they would, they would also need the exceptional few for their, with their consistent presence, positive deeds and words. And the memory of these would serve as a source of encouragement and strength in the most stressful of times, cutting through the noise of the crowd as well as the noise in their heads. Their presence, be it physically or in spirit, would, serve, uh, would sever the chains of self-doubt of anxiety and unhelpful thought processes to remind the athlete, to encourage the athlete to keep going on to do their very best. Now, these could include parents, coaches, and significant people in the athlete's life. Now, if the athletes need so much support in their journey, how much more do you think one would need in life? Not just to live, to exist or survive, but to have life. Life as highlighted by Jesus in John chapter 10. Allow me to read it for you. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. As well as John chapter 17, Jesus says again, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, don't we want our youths to have the life that Jesus has mentioned here, and especially when they are struggling so much in their lives? Now, I know that when I mention that the youths are struggling in their lives, some people may say, bah, what do youths have to struggle with today? Uh, compared to many others, our youths have not lived through the hardship of a world war, nor struggled through the life of limited resources. Well, there are definitely youths that are going through very difficult times, and even in Singapore, perhaps allow me to show you some news reports that talk about what the youths are currently going through. Now, in general, uh, this is taken from the Singapore Youth Resilience Survey, examining the stresses, the risks, and the resilience of young people. This is a 2019 article. These are some of the basic stre uh, stresses that our youths face today. School, money, personal relationships, peer pressure, parents as well, and loneliness. However, since the pandemic, referencing the next following uh, articles, there are additional concerns compounding the stresses that our youths experience. For example, in this CNA report, the pandemic has affected the human psyche. The, the, there's a youth survey that was conducted in 2021, and it found that a major of those aged between 18 to 35, and yes, they are youths, saying that they have become less sociable and more cautious and afraid. The finding also showed that the pandemic has led to greater insecurities echoing polls everywhere. The youths interviewed also spoke about their struggles amid reduced social interactions at school and workplace, their homes, 
their hopes and their concerns about the future and how the pandemic has led to more stress because of the recalibration of their plans and priorities. Now, I know that we, all of us, uh, we know that the pandemic or um, the COVID is not such a big thing now, but the effects of, on this particular generation can only be seen in years to come. All right, let me move on uh, to the next article. In this article, it says that one in three young Sing uh, Singaporeans have, has mental health symptoms. This is a 2022 article. It mentioned after survey, surveying 3,336 young people aged 11 to 18, about one in three youths in Singapore have reported internalizing, not just not expressing, uh, internalizing, keeping it to themselves, mental health symptoms such as sadness, anxiety, and loneliness and those aged 14 to 16 have more serious symptoms. And from their exposure to uh, the internet, um, needful, uh, but sometimes an overuse of social media, the articles also this article also mentioned that social media can trigger feelings of inferiority or inadequacy among the young. This is a 2021 article. That most young people today find it difficult not to check on their friends on social media and compare their lives. And it seems that one can't just do well in your studies. You must be an all-rounder. You have to have a good CCA record and secure a good internship at a reputable company. This constant competition emphasized by social media channels, by their peers, when everyone is posting about good things exacerbates competition and young people find that stressful. And then we haven't talked about uh, the cyberbullying as well. And the point that I'm trying to bring across is that they are under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. Now, there is no silver bullet that will be able to solve everything in one stroke because of the complex backgrounds, the needs and concerns of our youths. However, one thing is for certain, and I think that all of us can agree with reference to our own personal experience and faith, that our youths would fare better in this life into the next when they know Jesus and follow his ways, and especially when they are receiving for themselves what Jesus declared in John chapter 10 as well as John 17. Interestingly, it is not just about us, people of the faith. There are many other medical experts of other religions, as well as non-religious -religion, uh, religious experts. They recognize the benefits of spirituality, not specifically Christianity, but spirituality. In this Harvard article, it mentioned that spirituality is linked with better health outcomes. And I'll just like, you, uh, I'll just like to quote, Integrating spirituality into care can help each person have a better chance of reaching complete well-being and their highest attainable standard of health. Now, note what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the focus of our relationship with Jesus is primarily for good mental, emotional, and physical health. However, isn't it a plus to know that having a relationship with Jesus, focusing on Him through the thick and thin, have some potential benefits on this side of heaven? So the question follows, right? How would our youths know Jesus and how would they know how to connect all aspects of their lives to Jesus' life-giving words? Well, from our passage this morning, it tells us that Christ has given the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, with the purpose to equip his people for works of service. The equip here means katatismos, which means a bringing to a condition of fitness or perfecting. And the, and the objective is so that the body of Christ may be built up Akoidomai, built up means constructive criticism and instruction that builds a person up, or in this case, the whole church to be the suitable dwelling place of God. So if I were to put the two verses together, it will mean that these leaders are, is, are to equip his people for the works of service until, um, until they reach a condition of fitness or perfection, so that the whole church will be the suitable dwelling place of God. Now, I want to mention that this passage, again, is not mentioning that the apostles, the, these leaders, uh, spend all their time studying God's word only to deliver God's word well with constructive criticism and instruction exclusively. That's not what it's saying. The, these leaders, the, uh, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers are themselves to do 
what, to teach what Jesus taught and instructed, but also they are supposed to be demonstrating in their own life and through their lifestyle choices what they preach, what Jesus actually preached. Remember the various accounts in the Bible where Jesus taught his disciples? In Luke chapter 11, when Jesus was asked by his disciples, teach us how to pray, Jesus didn't just give them the very well-known ACTS. He gave them the model, uh, model prayer, if you will. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus preached about the turning the other cheek, and he demonstrated this in his life. In Matthew 26, when he preached about this, he not only retaliated when Judas betrayed him with a kiss, he even scolded John uh, when, sorry, uh, scolded Peter when Peter used a sword to either defend himself or to defend the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, He came not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And he demonstrated this on the cross, though he had access to God-level resources on the cross to save himself, but he allowed himself to be taken in the first place, to be spat at, to be insulted, to be beaten, and eventually crucified. Jesus has also taught how in the coming kingdom, in Mark 9, that the one who wants to be first must be servant of all. And in that same chapter, he demonstrated, sorry, in John chapter 13, he, de he uh, demonstrated this by washing his disciples' feet. Jesus also preached about loving your enemies in Matthew 5. And in his dying breath, as he was dying, he was still pleading to God to have mercy on behalf of his killers. Now, how about Paul? who was the one that worded our sermon passage today. He also endured a lot in 2 Corinthians. I mean, the list is there, you can see. To bring the truth of the gospel to others, obeying what Jesus commanded him to do in Acts chapter 9. He discipled others, not just with words, but exhorted Christians to imitate him as he imitated Christ's obedience to the Father in practical ways. So, the, these leaders, as you see before you, they are supposed to be discipling all of us through words and deeds. Now, coming back to our passage, what is their goal? The goal of these appointed leaders are until we all of us, every, oh, sorry, until we all or everyone in the church reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, what does this look like practically? The first thing is that we would know what God actually taught us from the Word, and we will have that, that, that clear knowledge so that we'll be able to discern what is real, uh, what, is what, uh, what, is the, what has the Bible taught us, and what the Bible did not teach us. Verse 14, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craft and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming not only hate knowledge, not only the word, but also in deeds as well. Uh, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Verse 16, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and built itself up in love as each part does its, not just saying only, uh, does its work. But hold on. Is it primarily the responsibility of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers? They are the appointed leaders, but there are also other appointed ones. Last week, Kim Yit, uh, Kim Yit uh, mentioned or explained in his sermon to parents, to grandparents, to main caregivers, to all of us, from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. Allow me to read it for you. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. The passage didn't say, Hear, O leaders of the people only. It says, O Israel, which means everyone. There are also other Bible verses as well in, in Proverbs, in, uh, in Colossians, that talks about parents, main caregivers, other mature Christians, guiding, teaching, and nurturing the young. Then there's also the command of Jesus to every Jesus follower in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20. Therefore, or go therefore, uh, this means as you are going, 
as you meet different people from different nations, as you meet different people from different age bands, disciple, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. So if we were to put Deuteronomy as well as Matthew, these, the two passages together, it will mean that all of us are supposed to be engaged in discipleship making for the youths. Not just the apostles, not just the prophets, not just the evangelists or the pastors or the teachers. Everyone else is to do their part. Parents, grandparents, and main caregivers, and individual Christians who are mature are to be a disciple maker in word and deed. Now, I must admit that discipling our youths is a long drawn and a tough journey, but I believe that it will be rewarding. At least we are obeying our Lord Jesus Christ, what He has commanded us to do, and we will be faithfully declaring and demonstrating to them the life-giving words and the way of life that Jesus has taught us in the Bible so that they can have a comparison with the different voices that they are hearing from outside. Now, parents, I would like to encourage all of you. Uh, youths, I need your help. Huh? Uh, could you do me a favor with a show of hands, uh, raised hands? Huh? Do you agree that your parents are more influential compared to friends and social media when it comes to your making big decisions in life? Oop, not this slide. <clears throat> I only see a few. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Thank you very much. You can put down your hands. Appreciate it. Okay. Even if our youths didn't indicate from this informal poll, a British survey polling 2,000 youths aged 13 to 18 who attend state or non-paying schools found out that 75 named their parents as being among the most influential people in their lives in education and career choices. This is a 2013... Yeah, this is a 2020... Uh, this year's uh, article. Now, in an Australian study, this is an 09 article, uh, titled Young People's Interpersonal Relationship and Academic and Non-Academic Outcomes, it reinforced, so there's a, there's a breath of uh, reinforcement. Uh, parents and teachers' influence on academic motivations of the, of the youths sometimes up to three times the impact of peers, said this associate professor, Andrew Martin. So it means that generally parents, grandparents, male caregivers, uh, main caregivers, we have influence over our youths, all right? Sure, you may argue that, oh, you know, these studies are all about studying and career, not about faith. But let's be realistic. When they ask you the question and ask your advice, your worldview will go into your advice. For example, if you are in a particular worldview, you will probably be saying this, that education and work is everything, and you gain your identity from how successful you are in these things. So that's one worldview. And then there's another worldview. Perhaps you will say something like this. Your identity in Christ determines how you do your work and what success looks like. Now, I'm giving you a lot of stats, a lot of Bible verses about why it is important for parents and the body of Christ to faithfully strive to disciple youths. But let me share with you the testimony of two sets of very humble and very faithful parents who shared about what they are doing to disciple their youths and their children. Now, these are the, their responses. The following are the responses to the question I asked them. So if I show you this gesture, it means that it is the first set of parents. If I show you this gesture, it means that that's the second set of parents. The first question that I asked them was this. Describe your vision for your children when it comes to life and faith. The first set says, to be joyful people who follow Jesus, love God and love others, to fulfill their God-given potential that they may use the gifts He has given them to serve Him and others, that they develop a real knowledge and a relationship with Christ and not just fall into a role, habit or ritual. The second set says, to continue having a relationship with God, to continue looking to God for problems that they may encounter in life and not to have want or need anything to be happy in life, but to trust in God for everything. Now, of course, if, I, if they answer something like that, it's really, really great. The next question that I'll ask them is, list some of the things that you would be doing to nurture them towards that vision. So the first set says, spiritual habits, spiritual habits, praying for their needs, 
for thanksgiving and for others at meal times, bedtimes, nightly devotions, spending time with them, trying to be approachable parents who listen, have conversations with them about their questions, and most of all, trying to be an example for them. Remember the theology as well as word as well as actions. Second set, as I spend time ferrying them around wherever they are going, I try to make use of time to pray with them and to check in with what they are doing. Talking to them about God, consist, constantly reminding them to look to the Lord in prayer, praying with them when we have the chance. Again, word and action, words and deeds. What are the struggles that you go through in order for, uh, when you are going through this? First thing, first set says, being busy, the, the busy pace in Singapore, not being a great example. Second, sometimes it's hard to teach them how to balance between what the Bible teaches about contentment and God's will for our lives with the world's standards. We sincerely want them to do well, to excel in school, to pursue passions and to do their very best. And with all these things, of course, there's this unspoken desire, right? Is there any support or not? So I asked, what are some things that the church can help you both with your own personal journey with faith as well as your Christian parenting. First, groups, uh, first set says, we are thankful for the children's youth ministries and the leaders and older ones, including youths, who are walking alongside our kids in teaching and leading as well as friendship and fellowship. So if you fall within those categories, kudos to you. Thank you very much as well, personally, because my children are being discipled by you. Thank you. Second group said, a second set said, we hope that our community can continue to provide a safe avenue for youths to meet, to have friends, to walk together during the tough stages of the adolescence. This is a group effort, community effort. That more mature Christian, mature Christians, please take note, would be ready to give them practical, godly advice on how to tackle social and worldly issues that they face. So church leaders parents, grandparents, main caregivers, myself included, we need to get on board with this because I think we know what will happen if we don't lead by example and we don't help our youths in their journey of faith. So let me reference a... Okay, I don't have it. Okay, let me reference this. Huh? This is an article that sta that's entitled No Religion, Why More in Singapore Are Turning Away from Traditional Faiths. And this is... Uh, this is a response to the survey that was conducted between uh, 2010 to 2020. Um, that it mentioned that the share of residents with no religion increased across all age groups. Now, I'm not sure about what's the numbers today. Okay? Uh, in this particular article, it gives us an idea of what are the reasons why uh, there's such a development. People are less likely, uh, sorry, uh, rely less on religion to provide them with an explanation for the many things that happen in life, but instead look to the sciences. Religion as an institution is no longer playing a major role in one's life, and so fewer people will pass faith down to their children. There are definitely those who officially identify with a religion but do not practice it. And the ominous statement by Dr. Matthew Matthews, the expert that was quoted in this article, says that increasing number of people without religion is an expected trajectory. Now, I'm sure that the youths, by God's grace, can connect with Jesus by themselves. Okay, Jesus will find them. The Holy Spirit will find them. But I think that we can all know, I think we all can be objective and we can be sure that if there was someone or a group of faithful Christians that would show them God's word, would demonstrate to them how to live uh, like, Jesus, uh, like, our, uh, like Jesus Christ, I think they would, it would be easier for them. It would be more helpful for them. So let's prayerfully start today. If you haven't been discipling your youths, if you haven't uh, dis chosen to disciple youths in a particular way or support a ministry, you can do so today. And if you have already been doing so, please keep at it because it is really, really important. Now, finally, youths, uh, you do have a part to play. I'm looking at my own children as well. Uh, youths, you do have a part to play in youth discipleship too. Research and reports also mentions that you have an influence on your friends. Now, let me qualify. Uh. Uh, there are many reports that mention that um, sometimes when youths are together, uh, not too good things happen uh, because they negatively influence each other to do unwholesome and unsafe things. 
But then there are articles like this. How can peer group influence the behavior of adolescents? And this is the quote that I have. On the hand, the factor uh, with the greatest impact in low involvement in violent behaviors is a low involvement in risk, beha uh, risk behaviors. And listen to this. Uh, having a higher number of friends involved in protective behaviors. This means that having friends with little risk behaviors and having friends with protective behaviors prevent violence and risk behaviors. Now, I understand that this is only behaviors. But if you can imagine with me, if it's a group of youths who are really passionate about following our Lord Jesus Christ, really, really wanting to live well and live correctly, in, they will be such an influence to other youths who are inside that community, yeah? So, youths, prayerfully ask for God's, God the Holy Spirit to empower you to influence your peers and the younger youths positively for Jesus. Uh, I must not conclude. <clears throat> It is my prayer that as we adults commit to disciple you, the youths, uh, by example in words and deeds, uh, leaders, parents, grandparents, main caregivers, okay, uh, we are committed to discipling our youths, right? Okay, uh, okay, maybe, maybe they are reflecting uh, very, very deeply. Youths, look at our example, follow us, and join us as you influence other younger youths positively, or your peers positively for Christ, okay? Remember, my fellow Zion, Bishan, Bipians, fellow servants of Jesus Christ, the goal is until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of faithfulness of Christ. Until when? Until Christ returns. May God bless you and may God bless all of us. Okay, so let me pray in close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'd just like to pray that you help us to not just understand this cognitively, but Lord, your Holy Spirit will move in our hearts to really, really consider uh, discipling a uh, youth, someone, uh, because there are many people that are with needs, uh, that have needs out there, and perhaps they put up a strong front uh, to protect themselves, but actually deep down inside, we all need you. So I pray that uh, this church, all of us who have the opportunity to interact uh, with people in different fears, spheres of our life, that we will be sought and light uh, to those around us, blessing them with our consistent love for them and also your word and also our demonstration of what it means to follow you, that they may see an alternative uh, to a life uh, to what the world is telling them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.